I want to welcome you to the TechSoup Global Network, and especially for those of you who are near here today. So at TechSoup, we believe that technology like smartphones, internet connectivity, training, and more have the power to help fight food insecurity. And today's speakers with their Tech for Good app demos are going to give you a great taste of what that actually looks like in action. So first, why are we talking about food security? So we all know global hunger, it's a growing crisis, and we don't have to go very far to look for it in our own communities. So just last year, the United Nations reported that nearly 2 billion people did not have regular access to nutritious and sufficient food. That's 2 billion people. So that breaks down to being about a quarter of the world. And this sobering statistic, of course, comes with the biggest risk to it, which is hunger and malnutrition. So also no surprise that this pandemic has only exacerbated this problem. In fact, more than 80%, or that's four in five um, percent of people have now been relying on food banks. Or right, let me repeat that. So it's 80% or four in five food banks are serving more people than they were, than they are now a year ago. So that's a pretty big change. And we're focused here on talking about solutions, but with modern and technological advances and considering that one third of the world's food ends up in landfills, why are still so many people struggling to get enough food to eat? So we know there's lots of solutions out there to help fight this issue that includes food banks, food stamps, shelters, international agencies like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but we still have one in four people on our planet struggling to find decent food. So we know this issue requires a really large multifaceted coordinated effort and that we all have to work on it together and approach it from different angles. So what we're gonna focus on today is how we can shorten that gap between food access with these little things that we've all looked at at least probably 10 times in the last minute, our smartphones. And again, you know, TechSoup, we believe that using things like smartphones, internet connect and training have the power to help fight food insecurity. So now that we've introduced today's topic, I'm super, super honored to bring on our speakers for today, who again are going to show how we are dealing with this problem in real time. So our Public Good App House presenters have smart solutions to reduce hunger and eliminate waste. And with us today, we have Jason Dealman from Help Kitchen by Twilio. Adam Dole with Hunger Not Impossible, Kate Howe with the Indie Hunger Network, Morgan Berman with Rolling Harvest by Milk Crate, and we have Ayo Ashinake from Food Space. We have Jason Dealman. Jason's a senior um, or a staff software engineer at Twilio, primarily focusing on UI and UX for Voice Insights product. He's working on Help Kitchen to alleviate the problem of the increased demand and need for food during the COVID-19 crisis. He's here to talk more about the SMS app that helps families in need find meals during these difficult times. So let's hear more from Jason. Welcome and thank you so much for being with us. As you know, I'm Jason Dealman. Um, going to demonstrate the uh, Help Kitchen SMS app. So a little bit a quick blurb about me and why I'm here or how I got here is, as you heard, I'm with Twilio. Uh, I've been with Twilio about four years working on the Voice Insights product, uh, a little more than four years, actually. And with the pandemic hitting, the reason why I'm here is I felt pretty helpless. So uh, this was a really great opportunity for me to jump in and try to, to do something because with quarantining, you know, other than donating, this was something I could do. It's a little bit of peace of mind. Help Kitchen, you know, with a pandemic raging, people out of work, food insecurity is at a high. And with uncertain times, you know, people needed to, you know, didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. So Help Kitchen provided a way for people actually using tech to get the meals that they needed from providers, the rest of the local restaurants in the area and keeping them afloat. And those uh, costs were actually covered by philanthropists, which was really great. So people could uh, not be so worried. The challenge, uh, so the system was working and, but there definitely were needs uh, for improvement, which is why I was kind of brought into this. And what happened is, you know, when somebody would text to try to get through the SMS app to try to get meals, there's a person on the other end of that text trying to process that, trying to find a match. There's a lot of time. So there's increased time trying to find a provider and which created a bottleneck and preventing assisting as many people as possible. 
and it also difficulty in monitoring the balance of capacity. Restaurants were only able to give so much and trying to find that balance was difficult. So how can we approve this process? Automate. The algorithm was created to basically, instead of having a person find the match, we used code to find the match. So with a combination of uh, Google APIs, try to find how far away they are for you know using the zip code, the number of meals they need to try to compare capacity uh, left. And then with the provider info, getting their address, their hours of operation and their current capacity to try to figure out, okay, who's the best match for this person in need, for this customer, because they are customers, even though it's free. So the first is send a text. You send a text to a local, local help kitchen number, uh, reply one to continue. And we also then have them provide info, their zip code and the number of meals they need. So then you enter the first your first name and then you wait. So you, you have all this information. This information is actually going to uh, the backend systems that are managing this and the algorithm tries to find a, the best match. So one of the things, ways it finds the best match is one, it finds the three closest places that have capacity left who are open. They have to have capacity, they have to be open. And so we find the top three matches, the closest providers, and then we give them a choice, like what works best for you, for the, the person in need. And so they reply with the choice. And at this point, then we want to confirm, like, is, is this what you want? Or give them an option like, oh, wait, no, I, 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 I meant to hit one. And uh, so they can go back and change if they need to. So then we await the confirmation uh, and that's it. We're all done. Uh, a match has been provided. So we create a record of the order, find that they're matched. That gets sent off to the that they can the restaurant folks can click when they actually confirm that it's been picked up. So, and of course, all the details to make sure that it, it's safe. So uh, a really quick note about the tech stack. Uh, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail because of uh, time time limitations, but Node.js for the Twilio functions, Twilio Studio to create the, the message flow. We were using the Google Distance API to figure out who's closest and currently using Airtable to kind of store the order information. So how do you get involved? Uh, one more information on Help Kitchen, go to helpkitchen.org. From there, you can donate, you can volunteer, or you can even find a way to bring it to your city. And up next, we've got Adam Dole. Adam is responsible for ensuring Not Impossible Labs and all of their portfolio companies have the right strategy to accelerate and scale their impact on humanity. Hunger Not Impossible is a software platform that connects people with convenient, nutritious, prepaid meals from nearby restaurants in a dignified way, all through simple text messaging. So let's hear more about Hunger Not Impossible from Adam. Welcome, Adam. Thanks so much for having me, and uh, it's great to be here. So just by way of background context into how we came up with, with Hunger Not Impossible so that we can contextualize the, the role that Not Possible plays. At Not Possible Labs, we identify what we consider to be humanitarian absurdities, and then we dogpile on those absurdities by bringing people from all sorts of backgrounds and disciplines together to create prototypes that we can ultimately incubate and move through an R&D pipeline to, to ultimately spin them out as their own companies. And Hunger Not Possible has been the work that, that we've been doing most recently. And we're actually in the process of spinning that out now. We're gonna be renaming it Bento. And so you'll, you'll probably hear me refer to, to it as Bento throughout the next couple of minutes here. And that, that's why. And food security meets the, the classic definition for us as, as what we consider to be humanitarian absurdity. Something that as a human, you just kind of look out in the world and you say, that's not right. With today's, you know, all the available wealth and resources and technology, we, we can actually solve this problem. You know, one of the things that we do at the onset of, of any new, new, new initiative that we're, we're digging into, and excuse the formatting on, on the slide here, but we get out of the building and talk to people who are at risk of that absurdity. And so when we started talking to people who were experiencing food insecurity, you know, it, we learned a lot. And, and those things ultimately not only kind of broke our heart, but enabled us to define exactly what we needed to do to, to solve this in a, in a way that we, we could do very rapidly so that we could avoid people having to, to make these painful, heartbreaking choices on a daily basis that are you know, definitely putting their, their quality of life at risk, if not, not worse. When we, we listened to, to those individuals that were experiencing food insecurity, and we, we realized that you know, a lot of the solutions that exist to support them were not enough. They weren't adequate. And whether that's 
practicalities. If somebody's living in their car, receiving a, a box of, of ingredients is not necessarily going to meet them where they are and, and address the, 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 the unmet need that they have. Relying on a bunch of uh, volunteers, while that's well-intended, it's not necessarily going to scale. We know that nutrition uh, and malnutrition and obesity is connected to those experiencing food insecurity. So we didn't want to contribute to an already existing obesity crisis in our country. And then the, the last unmet need that we knew that our solution had to address is the fact that not everybody sees themselves as the, as the person that can actually go and, and wait in line at a soup kitchen or stand in line for four hours to receive a box of food and providing that level of dignity is a core design principle of our solution. So we turned all of these, these challenges with existing solutions into design principles for our solution. If you go to the next slide, it, it's, there's a lot of similarities actually with, with some of the things that, that Jason just shared, which was really exciting to see. But Bento connects individuals and families with prepaid nutritious to-go orders from nearby restaurants, all through SMS text messaging. And those restaurants are already doing what they do best. They know how to make meals. People already know how to text message with their phones, whether they're flip phones or a smartphone. So we're not asking anybody to have to download a mobile app or sign into a website, do anything that they don't already know how to do or try and reduce as, as many barriers to entry as possible with the solution. And when, when this gets deployed by community organizations to the community members that they want to feed, and a participant is enrolled in the program through text message. Once they're enrolled, they just type in hungry when they're wanting to order based on their address. If they've already placed an order at the, on, on the platform, it saves that, that address. They can always update their address, but based on their address, it's going to provide a list of restaurant options for them that are in their vicinity. And they can go through a very simple ordering process, selecting the restaurant, selecting a curated menu item for nutrition, and ultimately confirming that, that that meal. And they get to walk into that restaurant, not as Adam, the food insecure individual, but just as Adam, any other paying customer uh, that that ordered their meal online. It's very data and analytics driven. So on a back end, we, we know exactly what's happening. We can really look at all that engagement at, at a granular level. We don't need to spend a whole lot of time here on the, on the workflow, but it gets deployed by community organizations as a, as a B2B to C service. Next slide. The uh, apologies for the, the formatting here, but the, the tech stack is the Ruby on Rails main application supported by open market messaging and backend integrations into existing APIs like Postmates and a few other things to, uh, to, to piggyback off of the existing menu items that uh, already exist on those restaurant platforms. So we launched just, just at the, in the face of the pandemic, we're live in seven cities. And we've served just over 100,000 meals to date. And we're excited to launch this as a, as a company. And, uh, and if anyone's interested in getting in touch, easy to find online, adam at notimpossiblelabs.com and appreciate the opportunity to share this. So up next, we've got Kate Howe. And Kate is the executive director of Indie Hunger Network. One of the projects she works on is Community Compass, an app that connects people with food assistance in Indianapolis. Users can find locations and information for food pantries, hot meal sites, WIC clinics, or WIC, and WIC and SNAP retailers, and can use the chat bot to determine their eligibility for federal nutritious programs. The stage is yours, Kate. Welcome. Thanks, Nicole. I'm glad to be here. As, as Nicole mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Indie Hunger Network. I work in hunger, not in tech, and you'll, you'll see from my slides that I'm not an expert on the back end, but happy to get any questions answered from any of you after the fact if, if there are questions I can't answer. So we started on this project because we do, Indie Hunger Network does a study of hunger in Marion County, Indiana, where Indianapolis is located every couple of years. And this is pre-pandemic. We found that 20% of residents in our city had food insecurity. And in any given week, 47,000 residents of our city were missing one or more meals because they couldn't afford um, enough food to feed their families. And when we asked them about, you know, different resources that were, they were using or not using, if they told us they weren't using a food pantry or they weren't using SNAP or other resources available to them, we would ask why. If you're, if you're missing meals, why aren't you taking advantage of all of the programs available to you? And they primarily cited lack of information as one of the top reasons that they were not utilizing all the food 
assistance available to them. So we've banded together with the City of Indianapolis Office of Public Health and Safety to think about how we could get people better information in real time. So the, the city has a food policy and program coordinator who got in touch with Caravan Studios, which is affiliated with TechSoup, and they came out and did a, an app design workshop for us at the Indianapolis Public Library. I see someone from the libraries with us today, so uh, thanks for being here. And so we had a, a workshop where we invited folks from the community, both people using food assistance and people who worked for organizations providing food, and we asked them to help us come up with some different concepts. We developed three app concepts. We put up posters around the city to get feedback from the public on what they wanted to see. And then we were able to, you know, narrow in on what became Community Compass. In 2018, we were able to secure funding from the city and we participated in a local civic hack that was focused on food insecurity and got some tech folks to come together and uh, develop prototypes. And the winner of that civic hack was Level Up Development, a local tech company, and we ended up contracting with them to build out Community Compass for us. So we spent 2019 developing the app together, doing testing with focus groups, and then launched in February 2020, right before the pandemic hit, which was timing we had not anticipated, but it turned out to be a really helpful tool in our community this past year. This is what the app looks like. We have both a smartphone version and it's available through SMS texting for people who don't have smartphones. What we find is that people living in poverty often have a smartphone, sorry, a cell phone of one kind or another because it's really their only connection to information. They may not have a computer, but they will have a phone. So if you look at the screen on the left, it's in English. On the right, it's in Spanish. You can toggle between the two languages with that little globe icon in the top right corner. And then these tiles allow you to select different types of food resources. So we're going to select free groceries, was, which would be food pantries. And you can see also free meals, and then you can get information on where to access WIC or how to use, what places you can use WIC or SNAP benefits as well. So in this view, we've selected free groceries and it'll bring up a map for you. The little blue um, circle shows where I'm located. This is, that's my house right there. And then around me, you can see all the different food pantries in the area. You can pull up the drawer on the bottom left um, picture and see all the things that are close by and then pick whichever one you want, or you can touch one of the pins to find a location, a specific location. For this example of Crooked Creek Food Pantry, you'll see some of the information we have available. So you can call the pantry directly. You can get directions in your map app. You can give feedback. If, you, if we've got information that you find is incorrect or incomplete, you can let us know right within the app. Address, hours of operation. If you keep scrolling down, you'll see what's on the third picture there. It tells you who's eligible to, to visit that pantry. Some pantries will have a geographic area that they serve or some you know, other limitations and accessibility information. This is the text version. If you click on Shelly, the chat bot, you can communicate by text, including getting doing some basic screening for SNAP and WIC eligibility. And it, again, available for non-smartphones as well by texting a certain number. This is the tech stack information. It means nothing to me since I'm not a tech person, but, but there it is for anyone who's interested. If you're interested to go to our website to learn more, indiehunger.org slash compass and feel free to email me kate at indiehunger.org. Be glad to talk with anybody who would like more information. Also, I saw there was a question about geographic area. It's currently only in Indianapolis, but we've got a grant to expand to the whole state of Indiana by the end of the year. So stay tuned for that. Up next is Morgan Berman. Morgan is an internationally recognized and award-winning entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of Milk Crate. Milk Crate is an award-winning mobile platform with a unique way to create affordable and easy to launch apps for volunteers, students, and community members. She's going to share more about how the nonprofit Rolling Harvest uses an app built by Milk Crate to make it easier for local farmers to share their fresh, healthy produce with the food insecure communities in which they live. All right, take it away, Morgan, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Nicole. Looks like, okay, great, here we go. So a Rolling Harvest is the app we're here to talk about. And Nicole did a great job of introducing me, so I won't even bother with that. 
my one claim to fame I'll mention is I'm a new pandemic mom, but luckily she is napping. So hopefully we won't get interrupted. Jamie McKnight is the program director for Rolling Harvest and she's with us on the chat. So we will also be able to hopefully hear from her later if she wants to share, answer any questions as well. So Rolling Harvest Food Rescue, this is a, a wonderful local organization in Philadelphia. They partner with local farmers, making it easy for them to share their food. They have volunteers that pick up, do gleaning work on the farms and then deliver that to different distribution sites. So the problem that Jamie came to us with was, and this is a, a quote I asked her for, she said, we wanted to find a way to immediately reach all available volunteers with events and find a way to document their time and efforts without a paper trail. Next question, please. So the solution that they were looking for and that we were able to create was an app that has made it easy to notify all volunteers in an event or action with a push notification. It's immediate with as much or as little information as we need. You will always have volunteers who choose not to move into the 21st century with technology, but for those that wanna join the party, our new volunteer app is worth it. So you can see here on the screen, there's a screenshot of the home page. We'll get into some actual more images of that in a moment. So the way that the app is used, it's specifically for the volunteer opportunities and calls to action for their nutrition team. And this is actually a testimonial from one of their users who submitted this. She said, I really like the feature of being able to directly message a volunteer through the app. This certainly comes in handy when event is, or sorry, this is Jamie. She said, this certainly comes in handy when event is canceled at the last minute. No need to look for email addresses or phone numbers to text, just go straight to the app and send a direct message. So this is very much helped with communication with volunteers. So the way that they send a push notification is they log into the admin dashboard uh, through the Millcrate system and they just fill in the information. They target which group of people they wanna send it to, whether it's all users or a specific subset of the users. And they're able to send that notification that shows up on everybody's phone. And when they click on that, it can actually open a specific page in the app, like a, a specific volunteer opportunity in the event calendar or some other piece of information inside of the app. Next. The way that it works from the user perspective on the home screen, you can see all the way on the left, um, that's where they can have kind of customized the look and feel of their app, including the button that opens up the event calendar. There's the activity feed where you can see what people are posting and sharing. There's a chat feature where you can communicate with the Rolling Harvest staff or other volunteers. Each user has their own profile. And then there's the, the navigation where all the other features are accessible. Next. It's available for iOS and Android, so uh, very important to make it available for both platforms. Next. And the way users create an account, they just enter in an email address and a password. They're able to select uh, from different segments. And this is really useful to be able to have different types of categories for them. The way that they organize their users is by location. They also ask for additional information, like what kind of vehicle do you have, which has been helpful for them to kind of think about what type of volunteer work someone might do for them. Next. And the way that they sign up is to click a, a, a shift at the time that they see available in the event calendar. Once they, they can also add that directly to the calendar on their phone. They're able to actually check in using the GPS of their phone, which proves that they were there at that time and place. And again, like I said, they can add it to their calendar and they will get points. So the whole system is gamified. So a user is earning points. They're progressing on the leaderboard. There's even the option to set goals and have competitions if that's desirable. Next screen. Next. Oh, great. Thanks. So once someone's checked in and it's verified that they're there, they're also able to have a survey. So Jamie or another admin, if they wanted to ask questions about how was your volunteer experience or how much food did you collect or what kind of food or anything else, you could have a whole survey that gets prompted after someone has checked in and collect that uh, qualitative information uh, from your volunteers. Next, the admin dashboard, the place where you she's able to enter in all this information and keep track of all of her users is all here. So you can see there are 284 volunteers that are using the app. And next screen, please. So this is where you can log in and add an event, a volunteer shift, or some other thing that you want to show up in the app, whether it's a survey, a poll question, an activity, a piece of content into a resource directory. Maybe you have a guide for volunteers or something. You want to add more content in there. All of that happens in here. Next, you're able to see how many people have registered, how many spots are left, if you want to turn something on or off. So all of that happens in here. 
and the different types of segments. So it's really important often with a program to have different types of users. So for rolling harvest, their location, their vehicle size, when they're available, the type of work that they're doing as a volunteer, you're able to provide different types of user experiences based on that role inside of the, the app and the organization and being able to message them and some different types of content based on that role so that the right volunteers are getting the right information or the right communications. Being able to see all user activity and being able to filter for it. So you can see this is just kind of a running list that you can then filter at the top to see who's doing what, when. Promoting it is definitely something that we're working on. So in their, on their website, we have a, a QR code. We're also creating a landing page that's going to explain more information about how the app works and how if you're interested in volunteering, you should download the app as kind of your first step. So using that as kind of like the beginning step in becoming a volunteer with Rolling Harvest. Next. So the way that this app is built, as this was mentioned, is actually on a platform called Milk Crate, and that's my company. And what we do is we help nonprofits build templated mobile apps so that they can launch an app in a few months and for a few thousand dollars instead of spending years and tens of or hundreds of thousands of dollars. We want to make mobile apps accessible and affordable for nonprofits. The architecture, you can read more about it on here if you're interested, but basically these are native React Native apps with an admin dashboard that's a, a web interface. And we're going to be deploying a, a web user experience, hopefully by the end of the year as well. If you're interested in learning about the features and the way that this all works, you can go to milkcrate.tech, but basically we have ready to go plug and play features where you can then set goals and upload content and update and track your app as I showed in the rolling harvest example. And something I'm really excited to share is that since we've been working with Jamie, we've she's actually connected us to other gleaning volunteer initiatives and other kinds of food rescue and food uh, access and social justice organizations. So we've actually started creating a wait list for a gleaning volunteer app to make it even faster and easier for organizations to deploy something like what Jamie did with Rolling Harvest. So if you're interested in learning more about that specific type of program, uh, milkcrate.tech slash gleaning. We have a wait list to start working with more gleaning volunteer programs so that they can use this kind of great use case that we did with Rolling Harvest and, and deploy it for more organizations across the country. And I think, oh, and this was just in case anyone wants to ask later about more detailed data, but we can get back to that later. We have Ayo Ashinake, and please correct me if I mispronounce that, and apologies sure, sure. in advance, Ayo, but you're with Food Space, and Food Space yeah. receives photos of inventory and translates those images into a text and photo-based online inventory for online shopping, and it includes nutrition facts, barcodes, general item descriptions, and more, but let's hear from you. Tell us about Food Space. Take it away, Ayo. Definitely really excited. And yeah, just starting off, I wanted to provide a high level understanding of where we came from and what we're doing right now. We actually started off as a consumer app. Our main goal was really to how could we figure out how to improve nutrition in America with always with also the goal of reducing food waste in a way that consumers didn't have to actively go about, you know, having that experience. So from there, we learned about a huge problem. Data is incorrect. Around 58, it's interesting to notice this, but around 58% of the information digitally is incorrect. We saw that as a big problem. We saw that as an education problem. And throughout the slides, what I think I want to focus on is thinking about individualism, which is really about translating that people that are hungry or food insecure should work on these problems themselves. We need to tackle that. Paternalism, figuring out the objective that, you know, the welfare of individuals creating a society or creating a policy without the consent of others. And then neoliberalism, which is really the rooted idea where, you know, it's a person's personal responsibility to work hard and then help others, not the government. This is really the structure that we're trying to take overall in terms of our process. So when I think about what we've been doing so far, just to let you know, starting from the app to where we are right now, we actually work directly with retailers and brands to get good data online. And from this good data, in terms of brands, they're having better sales. But in terms of us consumers, we're getting better data about the information that we're ingesting. The nutrition's correct. Is it healthy? Is it gluten-free? We're providing that to retailers to go about selling that to, uh, or providing that to consumers. Next. So, I mean, I don't know if anybody's experienced this before, but online grocery kind of sucks. You're trying to buy maybe, let's say 10 bananas, you get 10 bunches of bananas. There's a disconnect. There's something going on there. And it's hard to understand that. Next. The next piece is we like to give this example where I was actually shopping for an oatmeal 
like drink for my latte and pickle juice was instead substituted there's a disconnect like are we trying to look for a pickle juice latte or something along those lines it doesn't really make sense what's going on but again there's a problem there and then really coming into the next play where if you go next i think one thing that's important is products aren't being discovered was trying to find a product couldn't find it by typing in there couldn't find it by typing in plant-based burger as well and then finally i was looking for an impossible burger why is this happening it's a data issue online grocery as we've seen is exploding and people are going online to buy it. But guess what else is happening? Snap users are also going about buying online as well. And it's a really wonderful moment to go about educating and providing an opportunity so that people can also use those dollars, use those amounts for food that meets their family's needs. And I think the societal impact is really real where 50% of the time people are trying to really understand these health products, how it meets their dietary needs. We're not hitting our sustainability goals. I know it was mentioned about the UN a little bit, and then health issues are on the rise. How food space is approaching that, if we give brands and retailers a way to go about giving good data, this is how we can help consumers understand the products that they're eating more in a way that should consumers understand it. So what's missing, what we actually do is speed, accuracy, and richness. And how we go about doing that is we actually found a proprietary way to go about taking images, digitizing those images to have a single source of truth of information. Products are incorrect more relevant shopper choices. I'm looking for a gluten-free product. How do I find that? And educate shoppers. Well, this actually ingredient does this for your body. And let's go about having that in a way that a consumer can understand it. I can show a demo at the end, but I'm well, I would love if anybody, you know, if you visit our site, there's really what we're working on there. But if you think about what we do is we take images, brands have those, we digitize that information using our technology. And then we work with companies like Shipt, Walmart, Target to be able to provide that information and rather than having missing statistics of gluten-free, vegan, is it pescatarian, is it low sugar, we're providing that data into the retailer sector so that they understand these products. So what are we doing about health specifically? I won't go into this too much, but like I mentioned, we're really providing those attributes to go about understanding the products online. And that's been very beneficial for our customers being the brands and the retailers to have a better connection to their shoppers. And then finally, what I wanted to talk about is I have about 30 seconds left, but our real benefit that we've been working on with several companies, such as, let's say, the Rhode Island Food Bank, the CEO being Andrew Schiff and a couple others, is how do we make Snap and WIC impacts online better, but also in store? What we've seen is that with WIC, individuals are going back and forth to understand what their different products that are available for their dietary needs. Also for Snap, coming online, how do we go about making more people involved in this? Specifically, I'll just tell you about WIC in terms of time. But for WIP, what we're trying to do is educate people more so that there's more of an understanding of the products, but also make more products available for people that use this WIC benefits because there's only 7% of the information that's out there for WIC is being actually um, utilized efficiently. But I could talk a little bit more about that after, but thank you so much for allowing us to chat. And you feel free to visit our site, see how our app works, our platform. We've got questions fired up and ready to go. Let's kick things off with this first question. We're going to go round the virtual table and we'll start with this one. What kind of partners do you work with and how do you make those decisions about the partners that you do work with? So why don't we kick it off with, let's see here. I think Jason might've had to leave. So if you have questions for him, we will do our best to forward those to him, but why don't we start here um, with Adam? So Bento is provided to the, the community organizations that understand the need that they are trying to address. So Bento does not decide who gets fed, how often they get fed, the, the scope of, of duration of, of the program. We rely on, on our, our partners to do that. Today, our partners are everybody from like community organizations like Boys and Girls Club, YMCAs. We're starting to work with, with healthcare and hospital systems that are trying to address an at-risk community. And eventually our, our, our plan is to be working with municipalities and government entities to, to, to better address food insecurity in a, in a more efficient and effective way. It's they determine eligibility criteria. They determine how to essentially qualify those that are going to be enrolled into our program. There, just had to find my mute. There we are. Yes, thank you. Hey, Ayo, why don't you pick it up? Tell us about the partners that you're working with, maybe a little bit about what goes into that decision making. Yeah, definitely. So I think what was important for us is to figure out how to improve nutrition, how to improve like the dietary trends. We had to make very strong partners with some of the major retailers. We work with some of the largest retailers. We also work with some of the largest brands as well. 
but we also work with some brands that are trying to get their message out in terms of their health and wellness and how they're going about, you know, making their, 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 their products efficient for customers. So the take that we're having is that if we have a joint collaboration between nonprofits, Walmart, companies such as like that, and also brands to understand those goods and give a better definition to customers, people will feel more empowered in terms of their buying capabilities. And that's really how we've been able to be successful. So far, we handle about 150,000 products, which has allowed us to, you know, transform the way that those information about those products is being given to consumers. So we're just really excited to continue our goal of um, improving nutritional understanding, but also just getting good data out there. Appreciate that response. Let's head on over to Morgan and talk a little bit about partnerships and how those are formed on your end. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, we're kind of the reverse in a lot of ways. Like we're the organization that nonprofits partner with. So I would love to hear Jamie talk about this too. Maybe she can do it in the chat, but we, we actually have a, a criteria page on our website where we list out the types of organizations that we should work with because I was just having this conversation earlier that a lot of times when people in the nonprofit world think about mobile apps, they might think of one of two extremes. They might think, oh, I'm going to use an app to solve all of my problems. All I need to do is take everything on my website and on my newsletter and shove it into a mobile app, which is not a good idea. Or they might think, oh, well, I heard about this nonprofit and they built a custom app and they spent three years and $300,000 and it was a bust. So apps are terrible. And I hear both of those kind of perspectives a lot. And so our job is to kind of help nonprofits think through how do you use an app to achieve a specific measurable goal? And how do we make sure we're pointed in that direction? So when we think about partnering, it's about how do we help a nonprofit ask the right questions around what's going to lead to the ideal outcome of implementing something that's actually going to solve problems and, and help you reach your mission. I hear that. Thank you. And then, yeah, Kate, let, let's hear a little bit about partnerships on your end. Indie Hunger Network is a coalition of hunger relief organizations in Indianapolis, so we're all about partnership. We have nonprofit organizations that are our key service providers, and then um, we have corporate partners, state and local agencies that are part of the Indie Hunger Network. So there is nothing that happens within our organization that isn't in partnership. And so that made it really easy to connect with all the people we needed to connect with for development of this app. We hold an annual conference for food pantries in the city. So we already are in communication with them and could get their data pretty easily. That'll be a little more of a challenge as we expand statewide and try to develop those new partnerships outside of the city. So for those of you um, who are here, who are in Indiana, please reach out. We'd love to connect. Great. And I see chats also firing up with some really great connections and, and people who are learning more about each other. And we will be sharing this chat transcript out as well, because there are so many gems in there. So do look out for that in the email with your other resources. All right, let's head to this question now from Roger. Roger asks, can each of the speakers share their geographical footprint and their plans on spreading to other areas? And if we want their product in our community, how can we express our interest? Great question, Roger. And yeah, whoever wants to start. I can jump in. We're actively live in seven cities as of right now. Los Angeles, Seattle, Las Vegas, Oakland, California, Houston, Dallas. And we just launched in Chicago and actually just got uh, a million meal commitment for uh, the city of Chicago. So we're excited to expand there. But if anybody's interested in, in bringing Bento to, to your city, definitely get in touch with me. We're, we're trying to be strategic in terms of how to, how to grow and expand, but also make sure that we provide really convenient options and nutrition you know, is, is a key component for us for that in, in each of the cities that we're offering. And so definitely get in touch. And we, we, we're pretty optimized for dense or more urban environments in food deserts. It's, you know, obviously, you know, it's reliant on the supply of restaurants. And so we are at our best when there are accessible restaurants for, for those that are ordering. Okay. Anyone else want to react to that about how you're spreading your geographical footprint? If you're, if you are, and if that's a consideration right now. I mean, on our side with food space, we wanted to take, I think one of the reasons why we moved from an app platform to help individuals understand food and provide access to food information is that, you know, we had around 40,000 customers that were using our um, platform, 
but there's over 300 million individuals in America. I think what we wanted to do is work with people that already had customers, which are the major retailers, delivery organizations, to provide more data on the products that they were selling. So what we're doing right now is really a national strategy. I think at this point we cover every single state. And after that, you know, we're going to move to more of Canada, the UK, and then being able to provide additional information to other areas within the world as well. So really excited to continue to grow internationally. Great. And Kate, I know there are some questions too about, about Community <clears throat> Compass. Yeah, so Community Compass really grew out of needing to solve a problem locally. And um, we've heard from others in the state that they'd like to have it in other parts of the state as well. Um, there have been a few questions about expanding to other places and we'd be happy to have those conversations with anyone that would like to get Community Compass in their area. Really the, the major limitation is having a good data set because the app is only as good as the data you um, include. So please reach out, kate at indiehunger.org if you'd like to hear, hear more about it and talk about how to get it in your part of the world. Great, and this next question is short, you know, certainly not a um, short response, but let's, uh, let's hear your best go at it. So it's from Amy and Amy says, you have all presented some wonderful tech tools to help solve the problem of food insecurity, but how are you supporting the long-term sustainable solutions? There's a concept of feeding the need versus shortening the line. And I'm asking about shortening the line for example, reducing the need for emergency food assistance. So whoever would like to react to that first, have at it. That's an awesome question and, and, and something that we believe really strongly at Bento, which is we, we kind of base a lot of our decisions off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we, we know that those that are experiencing food insecurity and, and anybody for that matter that's hungry, forget talking to them about anything else that's going on in their life. Don't talk to me about healthcare. Don't talk to me about education. Don't talk to me about job training. If I'm hungry, that is the most important thing that we need to solve and stabilize and give people the ability to reduce the stress and burden of not knowing where their next meal is coming from so that they can focus on those other components of their life. And I could go into a lot more detail about the ways that we, we do that, that is driving uh, greater levels of self-efficacy and, and confidence so that they can apply that to other parts of their life that need more attention. But your question's spot on in terms of exactly the problem to be solving. It's not enough anymore to put a Band-Aid on the fact that food insecurity and hunger in the United States has always been an issue and has only gotten exacerbated. We got we to gotta address things at the root cause and we believe that hunger is actually the, the, the first place for us to start that conversation with people. Yeah, salient points, Adam. Anyone else want to react to that question? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I really, we talk about it as an either or feeding the line or shortening the line, but I really see it as a both. And you can't get your life going in a different direction if you don't have food today but you also need a long-term solution. And what we've found is that the best way for people, the, the best way we can impact people's long-term food security is through helping them get enrolled in SNAP and WIC because those programs have been shown to have long-term impacts on uh, physical health, mental health, educational attainment, employability. Those programs provide people with, with healthy, nutritious food, and then they money to spend on other things like healthcare, like housing. And so Community Compass includes that purposefully to try to get people a meal today, but also help them get connected to those programs, which hopefully after a couple of years of participation, they'll be able to work their way out of poverty. But there are stats that show those programs help people to improve their economic situation long-term. Thanks, Kate. Just to kind of, I think, you know, Kate, I'd love to connect after this because I think there's a lot of synergies what we're working on on our side in terms of our, some of the social programs that we're working on. But what I've also seen is that when we were first starting on working with our project, with our company is that, you know, individuals that were under the WIC, they had, you know, first of all, there's no kind of real credit card system. It's more of couponing, which is a major deterrent. But also on top of that, if you think about it, if you're looking for a peanut butter, instead of providing like the ability to buy any sort of peanut butter that meets that dietary need in terms of the WIC allotment, 
when instead it's more of just like there's these three products you can choose from these three different products well there's probably actually 50 different products that you could actually buy but because the government hasn't approved those yet because they don't have information on those products and people haven't gone about the process of registering those products it's very limited and i think that's one thing that i've really been trying to work on is how do we make a better system for individuals yeah, just to respond to that, Io, it, I think it varies state to state, but most states now have do have a debit card system for yep. an EBT card for for WIC, and in Indiana, there our state WIC has their own app so that you can go to the store and scan items to find out if they're WIC eligible, which I've heard has been really really helpful. So I don't know if that's something other states have available, but if they don't, that might be a great opportunity for some of you. They definitely don't, and that would be one. That's why I'd love to talk to you about that after this. Thank you. Thanks. Let's let's move to this question for Morgan. We had a question here. I'm trying to find it. Here is it now about gamifying, how to look into gamification to combat hunger and using things like built-in reward systems for referring others to sources of food assistance. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the kind of foundational features of our whole system of the apps that we build on our platform is gamification. So Anytime you sign up for something or read something or complete an activity, you can earn points. And we put it in the hands of the nonprofits to decide how extensively or not they wanna use that. Sometimes we've heard that it can feel inappropriate depending on the use case and who the users are. And other times it can be really fun and motivating. So we kind of let nonprofits make the decision about whether or not they wanna use it to the max or not and how they wanna structure it, if there's a reward or not. But the the opportunity is there because we've definitely seen it be useful. And so having, you know, for volunteers, having a leaderboard where they can feel that kind of sense of pride in their, in their contribution or having maybe a program when there's a program kind of aspect to a service that's being delivered, perhaps like meeting with a social worker or something else like that. If you're consistently kind of showing up to do the thing that's going to help you uh, kind of improve your life, then you can maybe get an additional incentive or recognition for doing that either privately or publicly. So having that kind of gamification structure in place makes it fun and easy to do that if it's appropriate. Yeah, I'd love to hear from, thanks Morgan, I'd love to hear Mm -hmm. from our other um, panelists here if that's been a component of the app building of your tool building and thinking about how incentivizing uh, this to share or just how that's part of your development. It hasn't been something we've considered for Community Compass, but we did work with some students at Indiana University who developed an app that was a game and any sort of add-ons you purchased or, you know, extra lives or any of that, the the funding would go towards a nonprofit organization. And it was a really great prototype, but uh, we had to invest money upfront to make it work. So you have to invest money to make money. And we were not confident enough that we would make that money back or make additional money to make that worthwhile. So it might, if, you know, as I said before, we're a hunger relief organization or a coalition of hunger relief partners for somebody who's an app developer that might make more sense. Great. So we've got a few more minutes here for questions. So if you have a burning question, now is the time. Go ahead and ask. And thank you to everyone who has asked a question. We're doing our best to get through as many of these and responding within the Q&A app. And also, of course, here right now during our Q&A time. Before we get to a couple more questions, I do just want to remind you all that we will be sharing the recording. We'll be sharing the slides and any relevant links in addition to the chat and transcripts. So you'll have that all nicely bundled together for you in an email within the next couple of days here. So let's move to this question from Daniel. Daniel asks, do you have any resources or plans for around 15% of the people in the U.S. who don't have smartphones? That's about 20 million people. It's a really good question. Who wants to take that one on? I can jump in and, and start off with that one because, you know, one of the insights that led to the, the Bento solution was the, the fact that I think it, it, it was a couple years old now, but that 96% of our country actually has access to a mobile phone. Now, it might not be the, the smartphone that we all use, but flip phones that have the ability to use SMS can be just as effective in connecting to, to resources. So we wanted to make sure that that was you know, something that was accessible to everybody or at 96% of the, the population that, that has access to even a flip phone that can connect to Wi-Fi 
and uh, and be used for messaging. And and we found that to be pretty successful. And even with some some families that we've deployed with, if not everybody in the house has it has access to that phone. If there's one person in the house that's responsible for ordering the meals for that day, then it hasn't been a, a blocker for for anybody to get access to meals on our platform. Yeah, very helpful. Anyone else want to just address the digital divide and knowing that our solutions are using technology to to access them? What considerations do you have around this? Yeah, Community Compass is available for SMS texting as well, and we're in the process of creating a web platform for people who might, you know access the internet from a library computer. They'll be able to to access it there if they don't have a phone of any kind. That's great. Any other thoughts, Morgan or Io? Okay. All right here. So we still have, we still got a list of questions here. I am going to try to move to one that I think came up in multiple different forms around languages. So we've talked about scaling geographically, but what about different languages? I've heard this come up in the demos today, but if you can share with attendees how you are scaling and deploying your app solutions or maybe plan to in different languages. I'll take that one real quick, I guess. Something that we found that's really helpful is the, we talked about segmenting users into different groups. I think someone else asked about that. And mm-hmm. so we actually have the option where if you wanted to have like a Spanish team, you know, or some other language teams, you could actually have the content rewritten in that language and then deployed in that context. And then all the content would be deployed that way without having to have separate apps or having to like do anything particularly extravagant in terms of product development. You basically just segment the users into the language that they're comfortable in and then they the content gets uploaded in that language. Great. And I see that Io is having internet issues. So he's had to hop. However, we do have his head of nutrition who's here. That's Kayla. And if you have questions, she will take a look at them and, and chat here. So let's see. And I will ask um, our panelists if you're seeing any questions that are really standing out to you in the Q&A that you want to make sure you tackle or maybe just to readdress in one of the questions you might have answered. Feel free to feel free to hop in as we get ready to wrap up. Yeah, I'll just answer that same question about languages. As I mentioned, Community Compass is available in English and Spanish. We did translate all the text in the app. And so rather than using an automatic translator, we we had experts translate for us. And so if your phone is set to Spanish, it'll automatically show up in Spanish, or you can toggle back and forth between English and Spanish. We have a large Burmese population in Indianapolis. And so we're working on trying to translate into some of the Burmese dialects, but there are probably three or four different dialects spoken, which makes it a little challenging. And so we'll probably just have those available on the web platform, along with some of the other more commonly spoken languages in Indianapolis, which are Arabic and Chinese and Vietnamese. And so we're, we're, we'll, we'll have more flexibility with the web app than we do with the smartphone app. Great. Okay. Well, again, a lot of different questions that have come in, and I thank each of you for answering them so well to the best of your ability. Again, it's such a multifaceted problem, and each of you have really unique and creative solutions for for addressing that. So we thank you for your time here today. I'd love to hear from each of our panelists here. What is one thing that you really want everyone to walk away with here today? And how about we start with Kate? Well, we just learned a lot through the process of creating this app. It was something brand new for us, and it really just made it clear how much need there is for using technological tools to get people information. You know, no one wants to pick up the phone anymore and wait on hold for 20 minutes to find the address of a place to get help. And so just, you know, it it was a great experience for us to develop this, and we'll definitely look to more solutions in the future, partnering with tech companies to get people solutions. Thanks, Kate. What about you, Morgan? Your one takeaway for folks to walk away with today? I guess, you know, what I said earlier, don't be terrified of mobile technology, but also don't think that just building an app is going to solve all your problems and ask, you know, if you're going to explore it, make sure you're asking the right questions. And, you know, we, we have a lot of those published on our website. So hopefully we can help steer people in a direction that will produce you know, something that's going to be an engaging uh, tool that helps, you know, accomplish your mission and i um, happy to answer any questions or if anyone wants to help, please reach out. Thanks, Morgan. And Adam, your, your takeaway for today. 
something that we've just been relentlessly focused on is just making sure that we are providing as frictionless experience across the ecosystem as possible. Making sure that participants don't have to download anything to get on board, making sure that we're not asking restaurants to change up their workflow, just making sure that each piece has as low a barrier as entry as possible and doing that in a really dignified way. So I would just ask everybody who's you know, listening as a participant today, you know, as you're designing solutions, think about how to meet your participants or individuals that you're serving, where they are in a way that's going to provide the least amount of friction to be able to serve them in the best way possible and provide that level of dignity that everybody deserves. We appreciate those takeaways. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Morgan and Adam, as well to Jason who had to hop off earlier uh, and Io as well. Like someone shared, we can't do this alone. We've got to uh, have these conversations together and continue evolving. So thank you for being here and we'll see you at another TechSoup event real soon. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thanks again, Kate. Thanks, Morgan. Bye, Adam.